You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Part 1 Introduction The Meiji Restoration, which at the time was hailed as the Honorable Restoration, was a pivotal political shift that reinstated effective imperial governance in Japan in 1868 under the leadership of Emperor Meiji. While emperors had been symbolically in place prior to this, the restoration marked the actual consolidation of power under the Japanese emperor. The new government's ambitions were articulated in the Charter Oath proclaimed by Emperor Meiji. This transformation bridged the gap between the final phase of the Edo period, also known as Bakumatsu, and the dawn of the Meiji era. During this transition, Japan underwent a rapid transformation, overhauling its political and social frameworks, embracing Western methodologies, and advancing into an era of industrialization and modernization. Part 2. Foreign Influence In 1853, Commodore Matthew C. Perry arrived in Japan on an expedition to establish trade relations. The following year, Perry came back with an imposing naval force to negotiate a trade agreement, hoping to secure access to Japanese ports. As a result, Perry negotiated a deal known as the Convention of Kanagawa in 1854, which allowed American ships to obtain supplies like food, water, and coal from two ports, Shimoda and Hakodate. This agreement initiated trading connections between the United States and Japan. Subsequently, under American influence, Japan reluctantly formed similar trade arrangements with other Western nations, including France, Britain, the Netherlands, and Russia. These agreements were called unequal treaties because they favored the Western powers, stripping Japan of tariff autonomy and allowing foreign control over its territories. In 1858, American Ambassador Townsend Harris further expanded trade opportunities by negotiating a treaty that opened more Japanese ports. Following these events, influential Japanese figures such as Shimazu Nariakira realized the importance of embracing foreign technology and taking the lead in modernization to avoid subjugation. These insights contributed to a significant national movement, the Meiji Restoration, which aimed to fortify Japan against the possibility of colonization by reinstating imperial governance. This period of transformation was characterized by the goal of harmonizing the country's traditional values with the advancements of the Western world, encapsulated in the principle of Japanese spirit and Western techniques. The restoration was led by a cadre of visionaries, including Ito Hirobumi, Matsukata Masayoshi, Kido Takayoshi, Itagaki Taisuke Yamagata Aritomo, Mori Arinori Okubo Toshimichi, and Yamaguchi Naoyoshi, who were instrumental in renewing and empowering Japan through a philosophy symbolized by the term Meiji, meaning enlightened rule. Part 3 Imperial Restoration The catalyst for the Meiji Restoration was a pivotal pact known as the Satsuma Choshu Alliance. Formed in 1866 thanks to the efforts of key reformist figures Saigo Takamori and Kido Takayoshi, their respective bases were in the Satsuma and Choshu domains, located in the far southwest of Japan. These individuals were proponents of empowering Emperor Komei, the father of the future Emperor Meiji, and were unified in their mission by Sakamoto Ryoma to confront the dominant Tokugawa shogunate and reinstate the emperor's authority. The death of Emperor Komei on January 30, 1867, led to Emperor Meiji taking the throne on February 3rd of that year, which set the stage for transformative changes. Japan underwent a major shift from a feudal structure to a more centralized state apparatus, embarking on a path toward modernization that left an enduring imprint on Japanese society. Concurrently, in 1867, the koban, a form of currency, was phased out of circulation. Part 4. End of the Tokugawa Shogunate The Tokugawa regime, begun in the 17th century by Tokugawa Ieyasu, worked to instill stability in Japan's social, political, and international relations following a period of conflict. Ieyasu's governance system, reinforced by his son Hidetada and grandson Iemitsu, bound the feudal lords, known as daimyos, to the shogunate's authority and prevented them from amassing too much land or influence. The shogunate formally ended on November 9, 1867, when the 15th shogun, Tokugawa Yoshinobu, 
relinquished his powers to the emperor and stepped down shortly afterward. This transition marked the return of imperial governance, though Yoshinobu's influence lingered until the emperor officially reclaimed full power on January 3, 1868. In his declaration, the emperor informed foreign nations that he had resumed control and that the term emperor would replace tycoon in international treaties, signaling a change in how Japan engaged with the world. The emperor assumed responsibility for both domestic and foreign affairs, appointing officials for these roles. The rejection of Tokugawa rule quickly escalated into the Boshin War, beginning with the Battle of Toba Fushimi in January 1868. Pro-imperial forces from Choshu and Satsuma defeated the shogun's army and seized Tokugawa territories, bringing them under the new central government's jurisdiction. Japan's administrative structure was overhauled, with the introduction of urban and rural prefectures and the maintenance of existing domains under a system known as Fuhankin Sanchise. On March 23rd, the Dutch and French diplomatic representatives were the first Europeans to meet with the emperor in Edo, laying the groundwork for modern diplomatic relations with Japan. The Dutch diplomat in particular aided in negotiations between Japan and the major European powers. By 1869, the influential daimyos from Tosa, Hizen, Satsuma, and Choshu gave up their lands to the emperor, with others following suit, leading to a centralized Japanese government. A remnant of shogunate loyalists fled north to Hokkaido and set up the Republic of Ezo, but their resistance was crushed by imperial forces in May 1869 in the Battle of Hakodate. This defeat ultimately signified the end of the Tokugawa era and restored imperial rule completely. By 1872, the transformation continued as Japan's numerous domains were consolidated into 72 prefectures controlled by governors. The daimyos who cooperated with the new order were integrated into the Meiji government but faced financial transition challenges that significantly diminished the wealth and status of the samurai class. Part 5 Military Reform In 1868, Emperor Meiji of Japan vowed to acquire knowledge from across the globe to solidify the imperial administration. Following this, a group led by Mori Arinori, known as the Meiji Six Society, was established in 1873, seeking to advance society through modern intellectual and ethical principles. Nonetheless, despite the changes brought by the Meiji Restoration, power shifted to a new elite, chiefly hailing from Satsuma and Choshu, who governed in the emperor's stead maintaining imperial traditions. During this period, the samurai class in Japan was sizable, far outnumbering the aristocracy in pre-revolutionary France. Given that samurai received regular stipends, they posed a significant economic strain on the state. As such, the Meiji leaders began phasing out the samurai privileges. They imposed taxes on samurai stipends, offered a swap to government bonds, and by 1876 made this exchange mandatory. To modernize the military, a universal conscription program was started in 1873, requiring every adult male to serve, erasing the weapon-carrying privilege that had once distinguished the samurai from other social classes. The elimination of samurai benefits led to uprisings, with the most notable being the Satsuma Rebellion led by Saigo Takamori, which effectively ended in a defeat by the Western-trained Imperial Japanese Army. While some former samurai resisted the changes, many assimilated into the new social structure, securing roles in administration, teaching, and the military, where their higher level of education gave them an advantage. The government also reformed land ownership, officially sanctioning the practice of farmers leasing land, which had grown during the Tokugawa period. This had previously undermined the strictly defined social hierarchy intended by the feudal government. The reformed Japanese military, bolstered by compulsory service and successful engagements in the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars, began to perceive Japan as an ascending global force. Part 6. Centralization In seeking to forge a strong, centralized nation with a clear identity, the Japanese government introduced a standardized form of speech based on the vernacular of Tokyo's warrior elite. This standard language overtook various local dialects and came to be used widely in schools, media, government, and the corporate world. 
The Meiji Restoration played a pivotal role in Japan's transformation, as it not only modernized the country along Western lines, but also shifted Japanese self-perception, particularly in relation to other Asian nations, moving away from the old Chinese Confucian order towards a new modern ethos. Driven by ideals of popular education inspired by the Enlightenment, Japan established a free public education system. This system focused on teaching the essentials of literacy and numeracy, along with moral training, that emphasized loyalty to the emperor and the state. By the end of the Meiji era, widespread school attendance had created a pool of educated individuals, fueling the nation's industrial expansion. The opening of Japan to the outside world went beyond trade. It fostered cultural and intellectual exchanges. Western educators and advisors were brought to Japan, while Japanese citizens journeyed abroad to learn. Through these exchanges, the Japanese became more familiar with Western customs, technological advancements, and institutional structures. Many Japanese believed embracing the Western spirit was crucial for the country to achieve greatness, enhance trade relations, and build a formidable military. Part 7 Industrial Growth the Meiji Restoration significantly expedited Japan's transformation into an industrial powerhouse, enabling it to emerge as an influential military force by 1895. As epitomized by the motto, Fukoku Kyohei, which translates to enrich the country, strengthen the military, Japan focused on economic prosperity and military might. In the Meiji era, influences from Europe and the United States spurred Japan to evolve its government and societal structures. Japanese leaders ventured abroad to gather insights and models for governance that could bolster their influence back home, particularly in bolstering production capabilities. While Japan benefited from these interactions, its lack of abundant natural resources, which diminished its appeal for colonial exploitation, played a pivotal role in its successful self-driven industrialization. Initially, Japanese society was heavily stratified into classes, with farmers and samurais forming the backbone of society. However, these classes also represented the barriers to industrial growth. The government harnessed the organizational skills of the samurai class, sending them to oversee industrial operations, ensuring the effective adoption of Western industrial methods, allowing Japan to secure its place among the leading industrial nations. As Japan embraced industrial advancement, there was a surge in the establishment of factories and the creation of critical infrastructure. Key industries included shipbuilding, metallurgy, and textiles, with the newly established facilities later transferring into the hands of influential private entrepreneurs. These entrepreneurs leveraged Western technologies to mass produce goods that were competitive on the global market. This growth spurt led to the emergence of industrial hubs, drawing large numbers of people from rural areas in search of work. Infrastructure development continued with enhancements in transportation networks, including railways and advances in communication systems. The burgeoning of Japanese industry resulted in an increased need for coal since it powered steamships and railways, essential elements of the era's transport infrastructure. Consequently, coal production in Japan witnessed a remarkable boost to meet this escalating demand. Part 8. Destruction of Cultural Heritage during the Meiji Restoration in late 19th century Japan, most of the nation's castles were taken apart or entirely destroyed. This occurred because the government had eliminated the feudal system, rendering the castles redundant as they reclaimed control over the regions previously governed by feudal lords. Military advancements also made the old castles redundant, leading to the conversion of some castle grounds into updated military bases exemplified by the transformation of Hiroshima Castle. Other castle sites were repurposed for civilian government use. Despite this widespread decommissioning, some castles were preserved thanks to the efforts of various stakeholders who recognized their cultural significance. Personalities such as political figures and locals came to their rescue, championing the preservation of these historical structures. For instance, the emperor himself intervened to protect Hikone Castle from demolition. Key castles like Nagoya and Nijo were initially preserved as imperial villas due to their size, location, and historical value, 
before being transferred to local municipal control in the 1930s. Himeji Castle's survival was more a matter of fortunate circumstances than deliberate preservation. Alongside these upheavals in the secular landscape, the Meiji Restoration also saw significant religious transformations. There was a widespread destruction of Buddhist imagery and temples, with countless statues and places of worship being vandalized or demolished. Additionally, a large number of ancient Shinto shrines were closed in a government directive aimed at consolidating religious practice. This initiative, part of the government's efforts to create a state-backed Shinto narrative, included the creation of 15 new shrines. These modern shrines were tied politically to the Kenmu Restoration in an attempt to draw historic legitimacy and bolster the newly established state Shinto ideology. Part 9 outlawing of traditional practices. The blood tax riots were a series of violent upheavals in which the Meiji government in Japan suppressed the discontent of the samurai class. The samurai were incensed over the government's decision to legally abolish the historical societal exclusion of the Burakumin, a group that had been considered outcasts. During the period known as the Meiji Restoration, which came after Japan ended its policy of isolation in 1853, authorities introduced several measures aiming to modernize Japanese society. These included changing the samurai's way of life, which was seen as outdated. As part of these changes, the Meiji government, led by Emperor Meiji, decreed through the Dampatsurei Edict in 1871 that samurai men had to cut their traditional top knot, known as chonmegi. This was a symbolic act meant to leave behind old customs and embrace a new societal structure. Additionally, during the Meiji Restoration, there was a cultural shift regarding religious customs. Cremation and Buddhism faced criticism, and initially the government attempted to ban cremation. However, these efforts failed. They then tried to restrict it to urban areas before finally repealing the ban in May 1875 after recognizing its benefits, including reducing the spread of disease. By 1897, the government not only lifted the restrictions, but also began encouraging cremation for health and safety reasons, adopting Western European arguments in support of the practice. Part 10. Use of Foreign Specialists Prior to the modernizing surge of Japan's Meiji Restoration, the preceding feudal Tokugawa regime had already begun laying the groundwork for progress by bringing in foreign expertise. This included figures such as the German diplomat Philip Franz von Siebold, who served as a diplomatic advisor, and the Dutch naval engineer Hendrik Hardis, who was integral to the Nagasaki arsenal. The Nagasaki Naval Training Center benefited from the skill of Willem Johan Cornelis, also known as Ritter Heysen van Katendijke, while the French naval engineer Francois Léonce Verny made significant contributions to the Yokosuka naval arsenal. Additionally, the British civil engineer Richard Henry Brunton lent his expertise to Japan. These foreign specialists typically worked under government-sanctioned contracts lasting two to three years and fulfilled their obligations with dedication, although there were a few exceptions. Over time, Japan continued to employ numerous other international professionals. Despite the considerable impact these foreign advisors had on Japan's modernization efforts, the government remained reluctant to allow them to become permanent residents. After fulfilling their contractual terms, the majority returned home, although a few, such as Josiah Condor and W.K. Burton, chose to stay.